I'm Amy McCormick, the first female president of Calumet College of St. Joseph. And we started this Women's History Month panel, uh, maybe not my first year, but my second year. So it's one of the favorite events that I get to mo uh, moderate and get to invite great women in to join me. Since it is Humanities Fest at Calumet College, I like to just say a little bit about the history of Women's History Month. So bear with me and I'll tell you a little bit about the history. Women's History Month is a time to reflect on the courage of women in past generations and to celebrate how their efforts and bravery afforded women the opportunities and freedoms they have today. This recognition began in one town in 1978 when the Education Task Force of the Sonoma County Commission on the Status of Women celebrated Women's History Week in Santa Rosa, California. The week was chosen to include International Women's Day, which is March 8th. The movement spread to other communities, so in 1980, a consortium of women's groups and historians asked the federal government for recognition. President Jimmy Carter proclaimed the week of March 8, 1980 to be National Women's History Week, citing in his proclamation that the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of the women that built America was as vital as that of the men whose names we know so well. The recognition was renewed by later presidents until 1987 when Congress designated March as Women's History Month. This year's theme is Women Who Advocate for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I am so honored to have three amazing women joining me today that have spent much of their own life's journey, the theme of our Humanities Fest is journeys, advocating for DEI in their various roles. You know, I wish I could read your entire bios. As I mentioned, they were quite impressive, but I wanna make sure that we have time to hear from you. So I'm going to shorten them a bit and uh, just introduce the audience to our guests. So I'll start on my far left, Vanessa Allen McLeod has served as the president and CEO of the Northwest Indiana Urban League since 2010. Prior to this appointment, she served as an administrator at Purdue University Calumet, now uh, Purdue Northwest, mm -hmm. South Suburban College and the Gary Public School Corporation. She is a certified civility in the workplace and cultural competence trainer and volunteers extensively in the community, including at Calumet College. She received her undergraduate degree in organizational management from Calumet College of St. Joseph, a master's of education with certification in counseling and personnel services from Purdue University Calumet and her doctorate in educational leadership from Argosy University. She was also our Brother Von Hegel alumni recipient in 2023, so last year. And next to Vanessa is Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz, also an alum of Calumet College and a current trustee at Calumet College, and she has a degree in business management from CCSJ. She's recently retired as Vice President for Institutional Diversity and Equity at DePaul University. Prior to her work at DePaul, she served as Director of Affirmative Action, Diversity and Employee Relations at Northern Illinois University. She currently serves on the board of the Illinois African American and Latino Higher Education Alliance is the first vice president of the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education, and is the past president of the Illinois Latino Council of Higher Education. Liz earned her master's and doctorate degrees at Northern Illinois University in Higher Education Leadership Policy. Welcome. Thank you. And next to me is Jody Fariz. She has served in private higher education for the past 20 years. She held a number of faculty and administrative positions at the University of Indianapolis before becoming vice president and general counsel for the independent colleges of Indiana. In this role, she worked extensively in the Title IX area. 
In 2011, she and her students founded Precious Word Africa while she was at the University of Indianapolis, a project to provide educational resources to children in West Africa and works with Burmese refugees in her local community. In 2023, Jody was appointed to the Midwest Higher Education Commission by Governor Holcomb. She earned her undergraduate degree from Butler University, her law degree from Indiana University, and is currently pursuing a doctorate in higher education from University of Pennsylvania. And her dissertation is entitled Successful Strategies for the Recruitment and Hiring of Minority Faculty on Rural U.S. Campuses. And that just made me think of my dissertation was internationalization of small college campuses and the role of presidential leadership. So we all have a little element of uh, advocating for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So as I mentioned, I'm honored to be the first female president at Calumet College of St. Joseph, which is recognized by US News as the number one most diverse college in the Midwest. And our tagline is you belong. And we've expanded that tagline in our vision statement to be, be known, be successful, and belong. Our diversity is certainly one of the aspects that drew me to Calumet College. Our mission, our diversity, our tagline, all speak to our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I would say access to higher education. You have all spent time at Calumet College as trustees, as trainers, as, as students, students. <laughs> and in your various roles from being a student to being um, involved in various ways. And I'm just wondering what you would say today about Calumet College of St. Joseph. So maybe Vanessa, why don't I'll, you? I'll go first. I would say I'm grateful for the opportunity to come. When I came, I was a returning adult student meaning I was over 25, closer to 30, with two small children, and um, didn't go to college right after high school. But I found that when I came to Calumet College, uh, the professors accepted me, understood that I was a returning adult student. I may have run a little late, but they were understanding because I had to drop the babies off and then go back and pick them up. But I'm thankful that I earned my BS here which propelled me to go on and seek my master's. So I'm just grateful for the opportunity. And I would encourage people to think about uh, attending Cal College. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be. It's good people here. And they care. And they make me feel that I belong. And that is true. Like the you belong. You yes. know, it comes. People come in all different packages. Right. And we want to try to meet you where you are yes. and kind of work with what's going on in your life, yes. too. Yes. So. Yes, thank you. Liz, you're a trustee, <laughs> and when you were a student, um, I think you had a lot of uh, classmates and a lot of fun. I hear great stories. So <laughs> a lot of stories, What yeah. was your time like here? And, well, and as a trustee, too, maybe you can build on that. Yes, I'm, I'm also very grateful, but I also want to add um, that gratitude comes with giving back, and that's why I came back, to be a trustee, to give to the campus that gave me so much, and to... Um, really invest in the students from this area. One of the things and uh, for me, when I was growing up into the education system, I was told I wasn't very smart. Um, I was the first uh, Mexican-American in my school, and they didn't know what to do with me. And so they kind of put me to the side and said, well, you'll never go to college. And so my mother brought me to Calumet College, kind of kicking and screaming, because I thought, well, I'm, I can't do this. I'm not mm -hmm. smart enough to do this. And I came in, the university, uh, the college embraced me, and I realized that <laughs> all of that I was told was really wrong, right? It was an error, mm -hmm. that I was smart, I was capable, and um, I got involved in a student organization called Amigos. I hear it's still around. Uh, we were the founding uh, members of that organization, myself, Louis Gonzalez. Um, and one of the things, it taught me about advocacy. It taught me about speaking up for myself. It gave me the agency then to go out and do the work that I do because I was smart and I was somebody. And um, I think uh, as being vice president of the largest Catholic college in the university, um, I did have potential. 
And so that's one of the things I want to say to the students is uh, you have potential, you can do it, mm -hmm. and Calumet College is a great foundation to give you those skills to go on and be successful in your life. Mm -hmm. When I first met uh, Liz and I mentioned our Los Amigos being a very active club <laughs> and she was like, Los Amigos, you still have that name? I found it at, and that was the name back then. And I know there are many OLA and there's many new names, but I think for Calumet College, I actually intentionally want to keep that na name, Los Amigos. I think that fits with us. We're an extension of a family. We're friends. So, um, so I don't, I don't want to change it. I think you came up with something great, and I think it's very fitting for the college. So, Jody, you've been here a lot, training, yeah. and um, but yet uh, also a newcomer. But you were at yeah. our gala last year, yeah. so you get to see Calumet College from the outside, and you get to go around to a lot of other institutions. Yeah. So kind yeah. of your experiences yeah. with the college. Yeah, well, I didn't have the, the benefit of going to school here. So, um, but I, I, you know, I do spend a lot of time in college and on college campuses. And, you know, I, I am a huge fan of private higher education. I think that that kind of personalized attention just in general is, is a real benefit for students. But I have been so unbelievably impressed with this place. Um, the the messages that you send I've gotten to know some of your students I've gotten to know Vanessa and you know and others some of your faculty and administrators and it's really really obvious that you're serious about equity that you're serious about access that you're serious about uh, you know giving people an opportunity who maybe haven't always gotten those messages like yeah. Liz just shared and so really been impressed and I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to work alongside you uh, even though it's been in a different capacity but to come and do training title IX training and different things here so really really one of my most favorite colleges in the whole <laughs> state and I and I I spend some time on college campuses so yeah you do and thank you for saying that Absolutely. because I know you get to see a lot of different campuses and I always think uh, people come here and, and they say it just feels different and I always like when people can kind of articulate that because uh, even we had an alum today talking about um, how it feels here and I'm like tell me more because I like to use those stories too because I do think that this is a unique place it and is. so it is. the ethos is, a, is hard to describe yes. mm -hmm. for sure. There is really a vibe here. Yep. There is an ethos and you yep. can feel it. When you're so on campus. thank you. I'm glad to have somebody say that that is on a lot of campuses as well and, and Liz you're on a lot of campuses too. <laughs> so Humanities Fest, our theme is Journeys and um, the theme for Women's History Month, advocating for diversity, equity, inclusion. And so I wanted to see if you could just take a few minutes talking about your own journey with ag advocacy for DEI. Mm -hmm. So maybe, Jody, you want to? Absolutely. So I do work a lot with, with Title IX, and Title IX is a matter of equity. You know, that it's a really important facet of that. Um, but in addition to that, you know, I have spent a lot of time with college presidents over the last several, ye several years. And one of the things that I've heard a lot from them is that they are on a quest to increase equity. It isn't an easy topic right now. It's pretty fraught. Um, it's pretty politically charged topic. And yet, if you're on college campuses, you continue to know how important it is and how much it matters to not lose that thread in a in a bunch of kind of outside noise and so that is part that you know that's why when i when i decided to get my edd um, i wanted to pursue research that had to do with with dei with trying to bring diversity into maybe parts of the of the state and of the country that aren't traditionally thought of as really welcoming places, I think it's really important because here's what's true. Um, students, young people are going to go out into a world that is becoming increasingly diverse. This country right. is becoming increasingly diverse. Mm -hmm. And if we don't prepare ourselves for that, we're doing a real disservice. Um, to the next generation. And so you know, I, I've, I've been doing research on uh, rural college campuses and how, how those can become more diverse, how you can have faculty representation that mirrors that of the, of the student body, even if it doesn't mirror the local community. And so that's, that's been part of, part of my journey. 
You know, I think about Calumet College, and um, we have this uh, one pager that looks at our diversity as it's compared to mm -hmm. uh, Whiting, Hammond, the local community, East Chicago, Whiting, Hammond, and East Chicago. Mm -hmm. Those are signed, sort mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, we're founded in East Chicago, we're located in Hammond, but we have a Whiting address, so <laughs> it's kind of the three-legged stool <laughs> with uh, where we stand, and then also looking at Lake County. and. It, it is really nice to be a college that represents the diversity of its, its local community. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's something that um, I think we've made some strides even in our, our trustees. I'm, I know when I talk to um, my colleagues, they're so impressed with the diversity of our board. Mm -hmm. And they always say that that's kind of a starting point. Now, we don't represent our student body yet, but I, uh, again, as I talk to my colleagues, they're like, wow, it's amazing how diverse your board is. So um, maybe you're a little bit about your life's journey and advocacy and, and uh, where that has taken you. You know, I think any story, right, begins with your beginnings and, um, and honoring those beginnings. So the first thing I'd like to say is I'd like to thank my grandparents who came to this country in 1920. Uh, I'm a second and a half generation, right, because mm -hmm. they got here when they were 18. My mother was born here. And so I am a, a first generation college student, but their dream was always that we would get a college degree. And so we are, we are living their dream um, when they came to the United States. The other thing I will say is that um, because of my experience and that being marginalized and saying I didn't have what it takes, um, I think when I got to Kelly, my college, and I realized I did, right, uh, I said I never want to make it, that that should happen to another person, to another student. I got involved in um, not only in student orgs, but then after I graduated, I became an admissions recruiter for County Med College at mm -hmm. St. Joseph's. So I got to go into Gary and Hammond and other schools to say, yes, you too can do it. And then that's the way I kind of, in my trajectory, all of the work that I did was around minoritized students, students who were underrepresented, and then when I started working with students and I started talking to faculty and staff, they said, we're having the same experiences. I'm not feeling that we belong, feeling isolated, um, and really not being part of this community. And so that's when I kind of made the switch to looking at the entire ecosystem, the system of higher ed and how some belong and some don't belong and how do we, we increase access. So it's been a lifelong journey. And I will say that um, one thing I learned is through policy, uh, you can change many lives. And so I first got involved through ELACHA on state policy, the state of Illinois, and then I joined the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Ed Education and started looking at policy at the national level. This is a national discussion, as we were talking about. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is under attack. Um, that it, it really, we're only talking about a certain group, but when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, we really are talking about positive things, right? That it opens up access for everyone, that everyone feels like they belong, that everyone can come to the community and live their true, you know, their true selves and their true lives. And so uh, I'm going to continue this work. As a matter of fact, I, you mentioned I retired. I am now working for the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. Um, I'm in my second month and we're doing this project, Amplify Student Voices, to get students involved in the national dialogue of where we need to go as a country and where we need to go in higher education, how we could talk to one another civilly, and how we could mm -hmm. all belong. Mm -hmm. And so I think the work um, has given me more, <laughs> you know, given me more reward than I give out, but it's such rich and rewarding work. So I, you know, again, advice to students, live your life with passion, vocation, because this is not just a job for me, it's been a lifelong journey, a lifelong vocation, and I'm still doing the work. And so um, we do this work for you all, right, mm -hmm. so that you can really be successful because we know you're going to be the leaders of tomorrow, and we want you to be the leaders of today um, to make us, you know, all uh, be well and be great. That's, that's wonderful, and we have to learn how to support each other as women and encourage each other because if you look across the uh, different boards and different organizations, um, there's not many women representation on those boards. And then there's this disparity between the pay, the pay. You know, um, men are making so much more money than we are, and we're doing much more work, I think, than they are. <laughs> no slight against the men. But we can do it all, really. We, we as women, 
um, we are miraculously made. We bear the children, we cook, we go to the grocery store, we look over the homework, we work, we go to school, we can turn on a dime, we can sit at the board table, we can be the president, and we can do that with grace. Um, but it takes courage to do that when so many times women have been pushed back and women have said, uh, been said to, you know, stay in your place, don't talk, don't do this, don't do that. Yeah. Well, now we are emerging, and as we emerge, we have to support each other, and then we have to reach back and help those other women become what they are. You know, with the Urban League of Northwest Indiana, for a decade we've been working in these um, silos, in a sense, trying to collaborate and trying to bring people together to talk about and have those courageous conversations. It's, it's, it's not black and white. It's, 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 it's black, white, Latino, brown, you know, it's age, it's way, oh, you, you're too bossy. No, I'm just assertive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you ask too many questions. No, I, I want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so we have to stand up and push back against those attacks. You know, right now we're dealing with um, the reproduction, you, you know, our, our bodies. Why are men telling us what to do and what not to do with our bodies? That is just crazy. So we have to continue to speak out, continue to fight, and it is a journey. Um, we never stop learning. We never stop learning, and we should never stop advocating, you know, for each other. You know, I think about, uh, and again, picking up a little bit on just Women's History Month mm -hmm. and the role mm -hmm. of women, and I think about my own experiences. So uh, my background was in public accounting, and so when I went to school, accounting was pretty much a male-dominated field. Yeah. It's not anymore, but I was uh, certainly a minority. And then when I moved to Chicago, I always remember um, a couple things about public accounting at that time. There were only two female pre uh, partners in the firm I was with, a large firm, mm -hmm. and um, neither were married and had children. So the role model to be able to look at someone that had made it to the top and to think, well, if that's a sacrifice it takes, that's really not the route that I'm looking for. Um, so I'm always aware of that. And then I'm also aware of, um, you know, I have a tinge of a southern accent. I'm born and raised in Indiana, but on a farm where there was not a lot of diversity at all in my high school. Um, and, and so it was something that, um, you know, I see such the value now. And again, a lot of, uh, uh, as a young uh, parent, I started hosting international students because I had really never been outside the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. And so um, being able to that cultural diversity mm -hmm. with food, customs, uh, there's just such a written, richness of the cultural diversity. And so that's sort of been uh, a little bit of my own journey that has uh, kind of made me committed to this, this work. Um, so, you know, you all do mm -hmm. advocacy in different ways. And I know that we could talk about a number of things that we that need to challenges that we have yes. um, but if you could pick one where you think there needs to be more advocacy whether students are getting involved where you feel like it it still needs more work and I, I know you could pick more than one so maybe if you can think about one area that call, call to action for more advocacy mm -hmm. Liz, you're in this space for <laughs> policy. Well, again, I, you know, I'm going to go to, so by the way, the flyer is up in your elevator. I took a picture of it when I came in. So if any students are interested, scan that QR code because you do have voice, you do have agency. You can get involved on the national level on where we need to go in higher education. But, you know, thinking about, and I thought, well, what are, <laughs> what are the challenges? They're so great. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really... Uh, and very focused on this sense of belonging. If we can't say diversity, equity, inclusion, because people find that word mm -hmm. um, not acceptable in today's day and age, which is surprising, but if they don't, we can all agree on we should all belong. And, and one Absolutely. of the things is, as we look at this, when I talk to students of color and LGBTQ students and 
um, students with, with any kind of a difference, right, is that they don't feel valued. They don't feel that they matter. And if you don't feel that you matter and you don't feel valued, then how do you succeed, right? And I think that's very, very important. So I think we need to do a lot, you know, in higher education to say, we don't ex shouldn't expect our students to change, but we need to adapt and to change to be more accepting and, and build programs where every student can succeed. And I, I'm reading this book on student belonging, and what, you know, we always use deficit language when we talk mm -hmm. about students, um, well, at-risk students, and it's calling students at promise, <laughs> right? So the promise of our students, their, their future, where they're going to go in their lives, and so we have to change the language, we have to change systems mm -hmm. and structures, and we have to say together, again, the, the rich diversity of who we are, that we all belong, we all can contribute, is so, so important. So I do think, and I just came from a national conference in Seattle of diversity officers across the country, and one of the things they were talking about, well, well there's two things, the, the delay of the FAFSA, <laughs> and that, um, so, and then when, with the uh, race conscious emissions, when the Supreme Court re reversed affirmative action and emissions, the message that it's giving students is that you don't belong. Students, um, mm -hmm. um, underrepresented students, that you don't belong, and please know, um, that you do belong and that we need to continue to work as educators mm -hmm. to change mm -hmm. this myth and this misconception, this misrepresentation of when we're coming and talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion and what we could do together. The power of working in a collective um, is so important. And so I'm just going to leave this because I know we're really short for time because I can go on and on. But I think to it's me it's... It's her passion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, it's yes. the systemic yes. and the way we mm -hmm. view higher education and I don't know about you but when I went to college they said look to your left look to your right you know two of you won't be here next semester and so we've got to change that perception mm -hmm. in higher education we really need to make everyone succeed mm -hmm. and I think about uh, the belongingness and our tagline you belong when mm -hmm. I was seven years ago uh, looking at Calumet College that just, like spoke to me now, the belongingness and you belong, that's, uh, that's across um, mm -hmm. higher education now, so it doesn't stand out quite as much, but I like how we've expanded it to be known, be successful, and belong. And I often talk about you know, that personal connection to be able to be seen, to be known. Mm -hmm. um, I try to know students' names and know something about them, but it's also that definition of success. So. Um, mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about not feeling prepared or people thought you couldn't do it. You know, sometimes success for our students might be just getting through their freshman year to know right. they can do college level work. And, and I think my, myself, I was uh, first generation to college. And, you know, if you look at all the, when you talk about at risk, I had a lot of those, those checks boxes, as being right. mm -hmm. majorly at risk. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, I contribute the, to higher education. Um, certainly couldn't be here today. And you're a president today. Yeah, and I'm a so president. you were at promise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I really <laughs> love the at promise, uh, at promise, and changing that language to be at promise. So when I'm with students, I can often I see it. some of myself in them, and so I love the at promise for sure. And, so, and making sure when students come to Cal College, the first office that they encounter, people should treat them respectfully and welcome them in because that first point of contact can turn a student around. So we just have to be respectful and we have to want people to come and want to talk about our differences but also talk about our commonalities. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt really good knowing that my professors um, welcomed me in the classroom. I may have been one or two African Americans in the class. So at the, when I was here, you know, it wasn't as diverse as it is now. But the professor, the leader of that class, was the one who made me feel comfortable and made me feel that I can do this, I can make it. And as we as leaders continue on, we need to empower other women and make them know that you can do this because I did it, you did it. It's a hard journey sometimes, but if you have people around you that support you and mentor you, that's something else we need to do. Yep. We need to do mentorship 
with other women, with other ladies, and let them know whatever you're going through, that too shall pass. But you can get an education, a quality education here, and we can work right. together. And I think just the importance of role models. So mm -hmm. I remember being a, a very young senior VP uh, in higher education, and I had two children, young children. And so trying to bring them with me to things mm -hmm. because I thought that was important because my experience was, well, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't rise to the top and have a family and have it all. So I wanted to be a role model. Mm -hmm. And so when I was on college campuses, I would try to be, bring my girls with me so people could see, oh, okay, you can have a, a family and mm -hmm. still succeed in your profession mm -hmm. as well. So what about something that you're working for yeah. in addition to your dissertation? Well, which is, yeah, yeah, but I, you know, I want to go back to that because I think about, um, you know, like I said, my dissertation is about faculty, and you know, there's this, there's this um, kind of point that people try and make. Well, you know, we don't have more professors of color or mm -hmm. from underrepresented minority groups, or 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 even in some fields, women. You know, mm -hmm. I think about mm -hmm. STEM fields or things because mm -hmm. there's no pipeline of them. They just don't exist. And I say to that, well, then you better figure out how to make a pipeline of them because you can't, that's a cop out, right? That is just mm -hmm. to say, well, you know. And so we have to do a better job. And one of the interesting findings in my research study that I've been doing is that without exception, without exception, on the campuses that were had really uh, made a commitment that we are gonna do some things different, mm -hmm. student advocacy was the thing that, that mm -hmm. had, had caused that and cry that had been this catalyst for change. Um, and in, without exception, the campuses said to me, you know, there came a point where students really, in some, in some instances, really, you know, mm -hmm. occupied the administration building or did a sit-in or, you know, right. really launched student journalism and, and that kind of activism and said, we should be represented here, and we are not, you know, and 33% of this campus, this rural campus, might be um, from underrepresented, the students might be underrepresented, and there's like three professors on the whole campus that are, and then those professors bear a huge weight of mentorship and trying to, you know, student support, and it, it, it can't go on that way, and you know, Liz said to me earlier, well, I've been on campuses where I didn't feel like I belong. And I say, then that's, then that's the problem, mm -hmm. right? That's the problem right. is we can't, you can't do that. You can, we can't just, not you, but we can't, we can't just say, well, you know, throw up our hands. And so where I think we need to, to there's a couple of things. One, student advocacy matters, right? It can really serve to direct and focus attention in the places that it ought to be. It matters, student advocacy matters. And secondly, you know, I had a professor say to me um, in this study, she said, you know, um, when I have a, a freshman student, first year freshman student, and they're, and they're really good, and I will say to them, you should be a professor if it's a, and she was in a STEM field. She said, you know, women, students of color, a student from under anyone really, but including those and especially those. She said, you know, I start nurturing them then. And I thought, wow, you know, that's a that's planting a seed way back down the road. But that kind of intentionality is what it's gonna take because we cannot just say, well there isn't a pipeline of of people of color who want to be in academia, then we need to figure out ways to because they 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 should be. Mm -hmm. They are they, these are brilliant minds. Uh, and we are we're squandering that resource if we don't try and nurture that better than we have. I kind of want to piggyback on that because, um, you know, as I was preparing for this lecture and I was thinking, well, why are women not, you mm -hmm. know, in STEM fields or why aren't we in, you know, the top 500 CEO leaders? And part of it is, you know, Claude Seal, Dr. Claude Seal, who's a social psychologist, calls it stereotype threat. So yes. from a very young age, women are told, well, mm -hmm. you don't have what it takes. You're, you know, you're going, you're not going to be a scientist, right? If you go to any daycare, right? Women, uh, the girls are playing with dolls. The boys are playing. They're firemen. Mm -hmm. They're spacemen. So they are already getting that those social cues that they're going to be an astronaut, an engineer, mm -hmm. a doctor, mm -hmm. a lawyer, a president. But we don't have those role models, mm -hmm. right? And then when you go up and through the higher, well, not just higher education, but through the K. 
uh, and beyond system, mm -hmm. so K through 12, but then beyond higher education, where are those positive role right. models or that give those micro affirmations that say you can do mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. right? So it is throughout the educational system where we start to build this, yes, you can, <laughs> see step with it, right? Cesar Chavez, um, and here's how you can get there. So how do we give folks the, 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 and women the tools to A, know that they could do it, mm -hmm. B, that they're, I are, they are going to do it, and here's how I can help you get there. Because what happens with stereotype, and just the way it happened to me, and that's why I started out with that story, if you're told you can't do it, you won't do it. Because you start to internalize those messages. So I think we really, um, as a society, have to look at the messages we give women and flip them to be positive. I want to just do a plug for the latest, the, the movie I just saw this week on the Feast of St. Joseph. I saw Cabrini. I've That's, heard about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when you talk about Mother Cabrini, she was told she can't do it. She won't do it mm -hmm. from the Pope mm -hmm. to our Archbishop. And if any women that are looking for just incredible inspiration from a woman that would not back, back down, to any man for what she believed in and her passion for serving the underserved and creating orphanages. And I mean, it was just, uh, so Mother Cabrini, Italian immigrant. Um, so it, it had a lot of parallels to, I think about immigration a little bit now, um, but just that if you have passion, you're not gonna take no for an answer. And so, um, for anybody that wants to see a really inspiring movie. Cabrini um, is really a, a movie of a really strong woman and role model, um, so. And when you mention movie, I don't know how many of you watched Hidden Figures. Oh, yeah. yes. Who knew there were three mm -hmm. African-American women that were behind the scenes that worked mathematicians, engineering, in order for the space shuttle to go up. Mm -hmm. Who knew that? So if we see more, right. if, we, if they put it out there, and for so many times, the African American population has been pushed back. But to see hidden figures, I said, who knew this? Um, so it's amazing what we can do when we can see a role model. Yep. That hidden figures, yeah. now you couldn't see that role model um, mm -hmm. But that yeah. movie is, again, yes. another mm -hmm. hugely inspiring movie mm -hmm. for me. And in the STEM fields, and yes. I had no idea until that movie came out. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was just me like, too. wow, amazing, amazing, amazing mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mentioned earlier today, uh, one of my favorite movies is Out of Africa. Mm -hmm. And it, that is Meryl Streep mm -hmm. in a man's world. Um, couldn't go into certain areas because she was a woman, but trying to buy this and run this farm. And so if you're looking for movies yeah. about strong <laughs> women, <laughs> Cabrini, yes. Hidden Figures, uh, Out of Africa, mm -hmm. those are two great <laughs> ones. And Burlesque is another one that I really love if you love music. So mm -hmm. share and Burlesque when I feel like I need a little pump up power. and strength, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there was another one that would not give up. And so, you know, I, I want you to say just a few more about um, students' voices because you talked about mm -hmm. the role of student advocacy and mm -hmm. getting to policy change. And I want you to just say a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, uh, the student, Amplifying Student Voices is a project. We're trying to recruit 40 students from across the nation to get together in a two-day forum. We tried to do it in person, it was too, it was too difficult. Um, so now what we're trying to do is a virtual two-day forum uh, where they get to talk to students from across the nation on what the issues are, you know, what, what would help them succeed, how do they think legislators need to move forward, what kind of supports they need, whether financial or economic support or social support, and really get together and talk about um, the tough issues it, we're not looking for a particular type of student, so it's open to everybody, um, or, or ideology. We really want students to say, how do I learn the skills to, be, to have civil debate and to say, how do we move forward together as a society? So we hope to hold it in mid-April. Um, we have a student survey. Like I said, if you, you put your phone over, you, know, you all know how QR code is. If you <laughs> put it over, it'll open it up. It's about six questions. We ask you to put a little bit of bio 
because we hope that we'll get, you know, we'll have hundreds of applications, we don't know yet, and we'll select 40. Um, but we're really looking at diversity of thought, um, underrepresentation, male female balance, and all issues that affect um, uh, higher education. So, uh, diversity is a, is a consideration, but it's really open to all students and really coming together and helping us. You know, we were talking about what do we need? Mm -hmm. We want to know what you need so that we can form this national platform of how we proceed. We know that legislators in Washington are making policy. Mm -hmm. We know their state policy. Mm -hmm. But how infused is it with student voices? And so um, it's new. It's a pilot program. If it works, you know, we'll do more. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a grant from the Lumina Foundation. And so we hope mm -hmm. that it will become a yearly thing. But right now, it, we're piloting the program. Hence, that's why there's only 40 students. Mm -hmm. OK, students, call to action. Yeah. Right. <laughs> QR code. and. <laughs> put in a little bit of information and maybe we can be represented. Mm -hmm. You know, Jody, I think about your work with Title IX and I am a huge sports fan and so I've been involved in sports my entire life and watching sports and, and um, on the Council of Presidents for the uh, National Association of Independent Athletics, so NAIA. And, um, you know, I, as I've um, just listened to testimony on Title IX, uh, you know, it has changed so much. We just celebrated 50 years, 51 50. or 50 mm -hmm. last year, I think. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think about Title IX initially was all about women and equity in sports. And I see that that, I feel like it's just migrated and I wonder where we are now with Title IX and for women yeah yeah I I think um, so I I brought I brought some figures because I and uh, no, figures don't stick in my head so I'm gonna share some of these because I think I think these are really very telling so title IX was created in 1972 and you know a lot of people think that it had to do with sports at the outset it really had to do with making sure that women had uh, a place in education in all of its areas really and so at that time, and I'm an attorney, you know, and so at back then, um, let's see, nine percent of med school students were women. Seven percent of law school uh, graduates were women, you know, and uh, just in general, colleges in the STEM field. But now, fifty percent of med students and fifty-five percent of law students are women, and so. That's amazing. Huge progress, yes. right? It has made an enormous difference in just making sure that women were not, you know, that, that we started to divert away from this. This is a, a man's occupation and this is a woman's mm -hmm. occupation. And, and, and yet we still all could name those, right? We could mm -hmm. still say accountant, that's a man's, you know, dentist, that's a man. Um, I bet accountants might be a larger percentage women. But now. the perception, yeah. I think, is still, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that, that, that certain jobs still bear this kind of gendered um, nuance mm -hmm. to them. But Title IX has really made a difference in, in kind of steering us away. Similarly, when we look at athletics, it has made an enormous difference. Um, in 1972, when it came out, 15% of college athletes were women. Now 44% of college athletes are women. And not only that, but the, but the elevation of women's sports is really something to see. I don't know if any of you watched Selection Sunday for the NCAA tournament last, last Sunday night. But uh, they, it, it, they, they made a practice on ESPN of weaving together the men's selection and the women's yes. selection. And that's wild. That is wild to think that, you know, that's, that's a huge movement, right? There is no way that women's basketball was, you know, was riding right in there alongside men's until just really recently. So I think that it has, yeah. Title IX has made a much greater impact than we realize. You know, I, I don't think that everyone knows. And it's, you know, it, it has um, become associated with sexual assault right. more than it has equity. And I think that's a shame, uh, not because I don't want it to tend to matters of, of sexual assault and, and um, violence. It should, and it does. But, it, but Title IX is also about equity, and it is about making sure that women have a place, an equal place in 
all of the corners of education from, you know, from K, kindergarten all the way up, um, and it's that matter of equity. So I think it's, I think it's working. I think we still probably have miles to go, but I do think that these 50 years have seen some real progress. Some progress. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's just great uh, data to share because I do think it gets uh, more focused on sexual assault and discrimination and after 50 years, there's been such progress in other areas that, you know, we, we still want to champion. And I think, did Title IX have some grounding in Indiana with uh, the wife of a former governor, yeah, you know? Or, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 actually, yeah, it was... Um, by? I think it was, yeah, it was yeah. George By. And, and his and, wife was, mm -hmm. I think... Um, yeah, it was Birch by. It was really interesting. If you study the origins of Title IX, when they first came up with that, you know, the, the point of it was, was that, you know, hey, in federal contracts, you have to have, you have to ensure um, other kinds of civil rights equity. You know, you have to, if you have a federal contract, so why aren't we doing that kind of with, um, you know, with higher, with education? And when they first put it out on the on the floor of in Congress, the only concern, like you would think that it was this big upheaval, but really the only concern was, does that mean we're going to have to let women play football? And the answer was, no, you don't have to let women. And then pretty much it just like slid right in. There was no great upheaval over it. In the years since then, I think it has come to mean something different. But back then, what it meant was we got to do better. Seven percent of, of attorneys and nine percent of you know doctors should not be women that's not yep. okay mm -hmm. and I think you know we see that that has really made a lot of progress I think that it. stereotype I think about doctors oftentimes where you say well what did he you okay, know exactly you just, or professor yes, you know whatever yes. so mm -hmm. and then um, I was thinking we now have a female uh, ref in football and Multiple. I think also in basketball yeah. I haven't seen a female umpire yet in baseball do you know yeah, I, I haven't know. seen one yeah, no I, I haven't <laughs> heard anything I think about that Caitlin Clark has yeah. certainly just um, you know made a name for herself but also yeah. women in sports and you I know think that two of the mm -hmm. top four uh, wa earners in name name image and likeness two of the top four are women Caitlin Clark, and Simone mm -hmm. Bile, or no, um, Livy, an LSU gymnast. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, and okay. the top two okay. are yeah. Bronny James and yes. Shadur yes. Sa yes. You know, mm -hmm. Sanders. And so, mm -hmm. you're, you know, it's, it's pretty good to come in third and fourth behind those okay. two, I think. So women's sports is really, mm -hmm. is really doing some things. And mm -hmm. well, that's great because I know we have a lot of athletes in the audience. Yeah. So I wanted yeah. to kind of oh, yeah. wrap up with that question yeah. because I think it ties in our advocacy for DEI mm -hmm. and Women's History Month. But I also, we have about five minutes left. So questions from the audience. Pam, it's Jeez. hard for me to see, so I'll just see. let you know. Even know if there is an audience. Uh, speak yeah. out. Yeah, I'll start with my question. Um, so speaking of journeys or relating it back to journeys, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, uh, what advice could you give to college students that are entering into the workforce as, as it relates to navigating their career options and um, selecting the right companies and roles to apply for? What should they, what should they be looking for? Great question. Mm -hmm. That is a good mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Do your research first. Yeah. Re research the company. Research the organization. Look at their uh, diversity at the top because diversity starts at the top and see if that is the spot where you want to be for research. I would say research the organization first. And retention. Right, exactly. Retention figures, mm -hmm. not right. just who's, uh, not just a static snapshot, but retention because that's going to tell you something about culture. Right, right. As you're doing that research, also look to see if they have employee resource groups. So do they have an a mm -hmm. African American resource mm -hmm. group, a Latinx resource group, an LGBT resource mm -hmm. group. Most major companies now have these identity-based mm -hmm. affiliations where you can go and get involved and and uh, be part of the community, but also look at their, the, where they give, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what communities yes. are they giving to? Mm -hmm. well, what not-for-profits? You know, how are they giving back to the community? And then as you're searching the website, you know, I know, it, you look at the pictures, right? Right. <laughs> what does it look like, right? Is it homogeneous or is it diverse? 
And I would ask tough questions in the interview, right? Because they're selecting you until you can say, you know, do you have employee resource groups? What is your career succession pipeline? You know, what would be my opportunities to succeed in this company? What is your diversity statement? What is that? Yeah, what, and what, are your, what does your representation exactly. look like, right? Mm -hmm. What does your workforce look like? And if they're involved in the community, then you know, right, they're giving back. They're doing this work in the community. So those are some of the things um, that you can look for as you go to employers. You know, the other thing I'm just thinking as you're, you're talking, um, one of my uh, good colleagues that I used to work with, um, he was hired as the only black male uh, and the only person of color on his college campus. Mm -hmm. And he knew it going into it. So it was also, it's also a time to really make a statement. Yeah. So sometimes I was just really impressed that he was willing to, you know, those are pretty broad shoulders. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, uh, surprised that even up front that they had that conversation with him and that he was willing to go to, to the one, to be rural the one. campus mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. be the to first. Be so mm -hmm. sometimes you have to be the first yeah. and the leader, yeah. but I think asking those uh, questions to make sure that, you know, there's a commitment from yeah. the institution, mm -hmm. obviously, um, were, they were very upfront with this is our commitment to you and, mm -hmm. and he has done great things. I'll say one other thing, Erin, that one of the things that, and this is going the other direction, mm -hmm. is to go in there with the knowledge of experiences that you have that are transferable skills and translatable experiences and never to walk into a room thinking, well, I don't have as good of a background as someone who did a summer internship in Manhattan or whatever. Go in there with the knowledge that your unique set of experiences mm -hmm. gives you some transferable skills that, and you should have those in your pocket to say, you know what, here is an experience I had that, and, and I think that's really, really important. The kind of company that you want to work at is going to see those experiences and go, wow, this person really has something to mm -hmm. offer that our, you know, that our organization needs. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think far too often individuals from marginalized backgrounds walk in thinking, uh, deficit thinking, you use that, like, I don't have these experiences and probably someone else is going to come in here who had some really, you know, great um, internship or something to share. Go, go in prepared to say, I have some things that nobody else that you're going to talk to today has, and let me tell you about those. And I think that that can really pay off. And I also, the, the advice I would maybe add is, I think I was so naive when I did my first interview and was interviewing with all these big public accounting firms because I didn't have any coaching as far as yeah. telling me how to interview. So what I can say, I was pretty much myself. So you get what you get <laughs> um, because I didn't have this coaching. Now, what, uh, what I tell my daughters and students is, Think of those personal stories because evidently right. that probably came out. Um, and if there is a personal story, they're going to ask questions, but have, have two or three things that you want to make sure you leave the interview sharing with the prospective employer because you're also picking them. So, you know, they may ask a question that may not allow you to answer directly, but if you can figure out a few personal stories to allow you to weave it into the interview mm -hmm. so that they get to know you, so that they, they're picking you, but you're also picking them mm -hmm. because they value for who you are. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think we are about out of, we are out of time. <laughs> so um, I knew this would be a great <laughs> session and I am just so grateful to have the three of you here with me today yes. discussing a very important topic and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Ye